Dear viewers, a warm welcome to our EFEX webinar on sustainable urban transport systems, innovations from Antwerp. My name is Matthias Duva. I'm head of the climate team at Ecologic Institute, which is a think tank based in Berlin. EFEX stands for Energy Future Exchange, and it's a joint endeavor with our sister institute, Ecologic Institute US, and the American Council for an Energy Efficient Economy, ACEEE. EFEX uh, is funded through the European Union's program on the transatlantic civil society dialogue and it aims to create dialogue and exchange on a range of energy and climate policy issues, specifically renewable energy, energy efficiency and innovative mobility. And so today's webinar obviously zeroes in on the mobility dimension. And it is part of a series of webinars that you can join live or re-watch online at your own convenience. We will be looking at options for sustainable mobility at the city level. And we are glad to be able to spotlight today as a specific case study, the city of Antwerp, which is the largest port of Belgium and a major hub in Europe. With us today to tell us about their work are two colleagues who are directly involved in this program working for the city of Antwerp. They're Mareike de Roek, who is a lead project coordinator of the Civitas Portis Initiative, which is a European project that connects port cities working together to develop cleaner, sustainable urban transport solutions. And there is also Katja Kishenko, who is the local dissemination manager um, for the same program. Thank you both for joining us today. But before we start, there's some important effects business, which is actually related to the innovative mobility initiatives of Antwerp that are the topic of our webinar today. From September the 22nd to the 28th of 2019, EFEX will be going on a study tour, which will cover Brussels, but Antwerp also, and Rotterdam and Amsterdam. And uh, there will be initiatives and visits and, and uh, relevant projects showcased that look at all of the three dimensions that are relevant to EFEX, renewables, efficiency, and mobility. And we will be looking at EU level policy as well as national and local initiatives. There are still a few remaining slots available for participation. And if you're interested, you can find additional information on our project website, which is energyfuturex.org. But now, uh, first question to Mareike and uh, Katja. Uh, please give us a little bit of background on Antwerp as a city and uh, the mobility challenges that it faces and how you started addressing them. Okay, welcome to this webinar. Thank you for um, the introduction and for inviting us to uh, share our knowledge with you. Uh, we're going to tell you something about uh, the measures and innovative measures that we're uh, taking here in Antwerp uh, to improve our mobility situation. So my name is Katja Kishenko um, and this is uh, Marijke de Roek. Uh, and we work for uh, the Smart Ways to Antwerp project in Antwerp. Uh, okay, we, so we have included uh, a map uh, for those who don't know uh, where Antwerp is located that you can see it. So it's uh, the biggest city in the Flanders region, uh, in the country of Belgium. It's located in the north. Uh, it has uh, a population of about uh, 524,000 people, uh, spreads over uh, 204 and a half square kilometers. So it's quite a dense, uh, has quite a dense population, uh, as you can see, which comes with several uh, mobility challenges, of course, if there are so many people living together and also uh, moving around the city and the region. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here you can see some more uh, numbers that show that. So as I said, it is the biggest city in Flanders with a lot of inhabitants, a lot of commuters, and also a lot of students. It's also a very uh, multicultural city with over 174 different nationalities, uh, which creates also additional challenges, of course, in terms of mobility and living together. Uh, we have a strong focus on innovation and creation, not only in terms of mobility, of course, but also uh, there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs, a lot of startups that are uh, starting their business here in Antwerp. So it's really a vibrant and creative city for those people as well. Uh, those, this is also shown by the number of self-employed people here. 
So we really, as also as a city, try to stimulate that. Uh, every, uh, per year, we have almost 15 million uh, tourists. Uh, those are day tourists from the neighboring countries, but also international tourists from all over the world. So also there are a lot of people moving around, not only the citizens itself, but also the tourists. Um, several, uh, a lot of companies, uh, not only in the city itself, but also in the port of Antwerp. Uh, Antwerp has the second largest port in Europe. So there is a lot of freight and logistic transport going around and also of course, a lot of people uh, working in the port area that has to get there as well. So this creates uh, many mobility challenges to reconcile all these different flows of people, visitors, commuters, citizens, freight and logistic transport. Um, as you can see here on the map, uh, Antwerp is also quite uh, strategically located in Europe. Um, we are kind of in the middle of uh, those neighboring countries such as the Netherlands, Germany, France, Great Britain. So a lot of traffic also, also going through Antwerp, uh, through the port, but also through other countries, um, north and south of us. So also there a lot of uh, different uh, mobility challenges and a difficult situation to deal with. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll pick over here because this is where, uh, uh, since I'm uh, already uh, over a particular age, I'm the one that can uh, tell you about the history. Um, the challenges that Antwerp is facing are not new. Um, we already saw that these challenges were there uh, somewhere by the end of the 90s, so at the end of the last century. And it was the Flemish government at that time that decided that since Antwerp is really key for the Flemish and even Belgian economy, that we should start with a kind of a master plan to ensure the, uh, uh, the transport possibilities in our region. Antwerp at that time was already one of the most congested cities in Europe uh, and congestion doesn't really combine well with economic growth and it doesn't combine at all with uh, being a port area. So what the Flemish government at that time decided was um, they were one, they were setting up a program which contained about 50 projects, uh, projects which uh, should enable a lot of freight transport uh, to be taken care of by rail or by waterways, um, and we should also enhance, of course, the the the, the motorway network, uh, which is really dense uh, in in Belgium, but because it's it's not, uh, it was undercapacitated. It was designed in the 60s, so it's 50 years old, and you can imagine that it was designed for less, far lesser cars than there are about uh, today. So um, it, in, it involves also a lot of uh, public transport uh, uh, in addition for passengers. And the aim was already at the end of the 90s that we should uh, achieve a 50-50 model split, 50 uh, by car or trucks and 50% uh, by other means being water, rail, bicycle, whatever. Um, this plan was, of course, uh, as most of these plans are, heavily contested. Uh, people were, didn't agree with a number of the, of the projects, but by the end of uh, 2012, we did, well, we had a third of the projects covered and the government decided that we should step up and uh, should really implement uh, the, the other part in a, at a far higher speed and, and rate, which means quite a lot of roadworks that have to be undertaken in our region. That was the situation in 2012. What was my role at the time? I was uh, the, uh, the person who was in charge of communication and uh, citizen involvement. And I really, I, I started to panic because I saw how many roadworks they were going to, they were planning around uh, and in the city. And I was thinking about the chaos that this would uh, really uh, create. And um, I thought we have to come up with really, really very uh, effective measures just to deal with the congestion that is already in place. And when we add roadworks, congestion will even, uh, yeah, it, it, won't, it won't improve. So um, this was um, what kept me awake at night. And uh, this really formed the basis of an entirely new plan. And uh, yes, this, yeah, I, was, I was hoping to press for the next slide, but please go ahead. Yeah, 
uh, uh, my panic was contagious. Uh, so I was able to gather a number of key partners. Uh, the Port of Antwerp, of course, was my first partner to work together because when the port is no longer accessible uh, for trucks uh, or for uh, or for the rail or for water, yeah, they have a major problem. So we were key partners right from the start. And we also started to work together with a number of Flemish uh, departments uh, heavily involved with road infrastructure or with water infrastructure. And we joined hands also with um, our railway uh, company, which is called the NMBS, and with the LEN, which is our public transport covering uh, buses and trams uh, infrastructure in the city. We gathered all, we, we all came together, uh, some uh, partners because they saw opportunities, other partners because they shared the same kind of uh, panic and challenges that we as a city saw. Um, at the very first, you can see that the very first mission that we stated was heavily focused on transport and on infrastructure. And this is because all the departments that gathered around the table, they were all heavily, they were all engineers. They were all very technical persons. They were architects and they were really heavily involved in yeah, putting the concrete and the steel in place. Uh, so the focus was mainly on coordinating all the roadworks, on increasing road capacity, uh, on improving traffic flows, uh, on expanding public transport. But this is a, is a challenge because it involves quite a lot of planning and quite heavily uh, heavy investments. Uh, so this has been taking quite some time. And then the idea was uh, we have congestion peaks. Uh, we have congestion peak at uh, peaks at least during rush hours. Let's focus on the rush hours. And another thing, and this has to do with something very stupid in Belgian legislation. Whenever you have a road work, you have to put up signs that really say literally detour or deviation. You don't know anything, but you have, if you have a lot of roadworks together, you have crossroads where you can really actually see eight signs pointing in all directions saying deviation or detour, uh, which of course is very confusing for whoever is on that crossroads, whether they're uh, uh, car drivers, lorry drivers, or even cyclists, they don't know what to do. Uh, so this was a project that we defined as really necessary. We need to have clear signage whenever you have uh, a road work. And another thing that we needed at the time was travel information. Um, Waze was just at the very, very beginning of its existence. It didn't even exist when we started. So um, we had to come up with ways of dealing with uh, yeah, travel advice that also included uh, a view of what was going on in the, on the road works. As time went by, and then we can go to the next slide, uh, our shared mission changed. And this was partly due to the fact that we, uh, as a city, received European uh, sub subsidies. Uh, the Civitas Portis uh, projects got started. And the focus of that project really is not, it's not, it, it doesn't focus on the infrastructure nor on the vehicles that are making use of this infrastructure. It's focusing on the people in the vehicles and on the infrastructure. So we really were able to focus on travelers and on travel behavior. So you see that the mission kind of shifted. We lumped together the coordination of roadwork planning and signage and rerouting because this is really what all the technical people deal with. And that's where they're happy. That's the field where they're happy about. And then you can see that we added a number of things, the things we are happy about because Katja and I, we are both marketeers. We are really, uh, communication experts. So we're, we don't, we're not really that much into building things. We are really into talking to people and in change, helping them change their behavior. So the first thing we did was integrate all the communication about these roadworks because we didn't want all these different departments telling their story. No, we wanted just one story to be told to the people for who it was relevant. This was a major change. What we also did, and this was new, none of the engineers thought about this, but uh, we saw through market research that quite a lot of trips are very short trips. They're less than seven kilometers or less than 15 kilometers. So these are trips which are very feasible for cyclists. So it was because of this market research that we, we told the engineers, you don't need to expand or make very expensive uh, um, 
uh, investments into expanding the rail network and so on. No, really just build cycling paths. That's not that expensive. And you can also use the existing roads and convert these into cycling streets. So it's already there. Use the infrastructure that's there. So it's very cheap. And this is something that politicians really like to hear. So we had a marketing uh, proposition also for the political side. And what we also did was uh, at the very first, we were inspired by, yes, it's, it's horrible to say, but by Boris Johnson, who uh, set up a, a personal travel advice uh, scheme in London uh, with view of the Olympic uh, Games uh, back then. Uh, and we copied this, but then we started thinking, yeah, but giving personal travel advice, that's really, really very, very inefficient because you need one person to talk to another person. And we thought, why don't we do this online? So we've got a computer talking to perhaps thousand persons. And today we've got a computer system. Well, Takatya will tell you about this. It talks to quite a number of people. Uh, what we also uh, did was because we thought that the congestion peak was during rush hours, we thought, why don't we go and talk with the employers? Because it's the fact that they have this tight schemes and they all want to start their company either at eight o'clock or half past eight or nine o'clock that gets all these people stuck in their cars before half before eight o'clock or between uh, nine o'clock so we set up a scheme to work together with employers in the region um just to change this but today we know that the employers that well it doesn't suffice because congestion now starts uh at half past uh seven in the morning and it lasts until half past seven in the evening so it's it's uh and this is the reason why we also also started together with working with uh, we started up a collaboration with the residents in the area in the areas around the roadworks because if we can convince them to start traveling in a different way perhaps yeah we have less congestion around the roadworks themselves and another thing we did, and this was uh, because we noticed that public transport alone was, didn't, was, wasn't going to suffice to, to accommodate everyone. We also started a marketplace for uh, private mobility providers. And this is really new. And this is the reason why today in Antwerp we have quite a lot of uh, mobi shared mobility schemes. And yeah, Katja will tell you a little bit more about that. Thank you very much uh, and for that background and for outlining uh, the, the main challenges. Uh, it, it seems that you use the combination of data and communications to, to engage and convince people. Uh, can I just get that straight? Was that basically part of the change in the mission or was that something that took place after the mission had already been changed? No, that was really, it's, it's, it has to do with my background. I was, uh, I was city marketeer between 2004 and 2011. Uh, and so I was able with my previous team to set up a market research scheme for the city, which has been uh, gathering data now for more than 10 years. Um, so we've got data of about uh, 10% of our uh, Antwerp residents, which is which, which makes it statistically very reliable and, and valid. And so uh, we had a number of insights which our Flemish um, partners didn't have. And because we really did uh, a very thorough market research, we saw that there were qu quite a of, number of opportunities and possibilities that they didn't think about. But that's because they always go and into uh, infrastructural uh, projects just for the sake of the infrastructure and not because they are looking at the side of the of what we call the mobility consumers the travelers and so this is really where the revolution took place that they had somebody who really believes in market research and who really um, kind of incorporated all the insights that were already there we had them as a city had all these insights and um, I, I simply made them available uh, that's a super interesting story um, and one that I'm sure you know many other cities are, are will be interested in hearing too. Um, we've you've already outlined how you changed the focus uh, to you know more people-centered approach to mobility. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell us more about how you started implementing that mission and which measures you devised, please. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, because it started out, well, let's go to the next slide. Because it started out with a, a program of well, filled with engineers, uh, of course, they, they came up with a number of what we call hard measures, or at least they call them hard measures. I, I call them infrastructural measures. So um, the first thing they focused on was the further expansion of the train network. We didn't go very far there. It's very difficult because we don't own the real, uh, real uh, network, uh, train uh, network. It's owned by the federal government, and it's very complicated in Belgium. But that's even a level beyond, uh, above uh, the Flemish government. So very little control there. Uh, we also decided that we needed more park and rides at the edge of our city. We have already about 13 park and rides today, but they don't accommodate that many cars. And this is something that the Flemish government needs to do. We're not very far there. It's not really working. Then we also defined that we needed to expand the dense network of, of trams. We're getting there. As of uh, November of this year, we'll have expanded the tram network by another uh, 10 kilometers. And we'll have, I think, an additional uh, set of, I think, three tram lines crossing, crisscrossing really through the city and through the region that will be added uh, by the end of this year. So here we are making progress. Um, enhancing traffic flows is quite a challenge because here we have to collaborate with uh, the Flemish government and here we have to implement a number of ITS uh, applications and this is uh, challenging because if you want to really control your tra traffic flows you need to have uh, traffic lights at your crossroads that you can control and what was the case we had quite a number of analog traffic lights we couldn't control them so the first thing that we had to do, and this, uh, this uh, task is now finished, we had to put out fiberglass just to be able to provide yeah, the, a digital, a digital uh, feature to these traffic lights in a secure way because we didn't want a cloud application because we were, uh, yeah, uh, because of the terrorist attacks that were here uh, in 2016, it was really decided that we wanted a very close circuit that controls the traffic lights. So we're making progress here, but we, we're still looking at uh, a couple of years uh, of work just to really get this working. And then there were two areas where we could really make way, which was the area of the cycling highways and the bike sharing schemes, the missing links when it comes to the cycling network. Here as a city, uh, you, you're in control. We were, at least we were in control and we could move very fast because these were all very cheap measures. It often took uh, yeah, um, uh, a little bit of paint just to implement these measures. So these were quick measures. And another uh, set of measures which well, we were able to make quite a lot of progress were measures that were um, uh, yeah, really uh, created within Civitas Portis. And that's where our colleagues in the port of Antwerp came up with very bright ideas um, to uh, cross, uh, because yeah, Antwerp has, is, 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 is crossed by the river Skelt. We are a port, so we have a big river, and this river really is a barrier. And so when you're a cyclist, it, uh, it often took you more than 40 kilometers just to get across the river. So they came up with really innovative ideas. Why not make a boat that really crosses the river in a very fast way, but also really uh, goes along the river. So you can cover about uh, 30 kilometers in a very fast boat and at the same time cross the river. But and they also, and with your bike on it, of course, but they also came up with uh, the idea of, for instance, a bike bus which may seem strange, but they actually, they have a bus that uh, accommodates cyclists and helps the cyclists through uh, motorway tunnels where of course no cyclists are allowed. And so they can really make very, they really shortcut uh, uh, quite a distance uh, by having this bike bus. This, so you're on the bus for let's say 10 minutes, but it helps you to get from one side of the river to the other one. So yeah, it's often they're very, very creative and very cheap ideas uh, to to yeah to help people uh, change their uh, uh, commuting behavior. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. So we can, Matt, can we can... show the next slide, please? Yes. Uh, so as Marika tell uh, already told, uh, there was throughout the years there was a shift from a focus on hard measures to really what we now call the soft measures. So really the communication and the marketing behind of it, and that is uh, what Smart Ways to Antwerp is all about. Uh, it was 
uh, launched in 2015, 2016. Uh, and it is really an integrated marketing approach and a cooperation framework with the aim of changing travel behavior. So really two components there. First of all, it is a marketing approach. So what we do is uh, do a lot of communication, do a lot of marketing, raising awareness around um, sustainable mobility, because we notice that uh, only uh, building infrastructure doesn't uh, make doesn't result in people really going to alternatives so we really have to convince them to try out the bike the public transport all these shared mobility systems so that's one part of the of smart ways to answer and the second part is cooperation so as Mariah had told um, the the solutions that are offered by the government alone are not going to solve the mobility problem so the public transport and the bike, it's not the only way to move around. So we really go on partnerships uh, with the private sector, with private mobility service provider to create new solutions in Antwerp, in the city, in the port, such as shared mobility systems, shared bikes, shared electric scooters um, and things like that. So we really, as a government, work actively together with them with the aim of changing people's behavior. Um, and on the next slide, uh, you can see uh, some principles that we hold on to uh, when working on this, because behavioral change is really something that you have to incorporate in your entire strategy. So it's not one measure or one thought that you have. You really have to incorporate it in your entire story. Uh, and for this, we have uh, well five principles, let's say, that we hold as key factors. So firstly, as Marijke also told, uh, is to put the users really in the center of it. Uh, they are the ones that have to use the mobility solutions that you offer them. So you really have to make sure that it's easy for them to use it and it's really a valuable and uh, a good alternative to the car. Otherwise, people will stay in the car because that's, that's easy and that's what they're used to. Uh, on the other hand, you still have to offer them options. People like to feel free to choose what they do. You can't say to everyone, you have to use the bike. No, they, they like to have options. They like to choose uh, which fits best for uh, every situation. Uh, but then the other side is that there are a lot, of, a lot of choices. So you really have to help them choose. It's not always easy for people to know what's the best solution for them, or even if a certain solution exists. Um, so really you have to work on that as well. That's why we offer, for example, travel advice and things like that. But I will talk about that later. Um, you also have to target and engage intermediary groups because they can help to uh, reach the target audience that you are trying to reach. So you don't have always direct contact with everybody, but you can use other groups as well. And of course, uh, very important is to monitor and to evaluate all the time. So you can always improve and learn lessons and uh, improve what you are doing. So that's very important as well. Uh, and then on the next slide, I think uh, you can see, uh, yes, the model. So all of that, uh, we actually base it on a certain model that was um, created by uh, also a marketing and behavioral mm -hmm. change uh, specialist. So that's the one that you see here. It looks a bit complicated, but it's actually quite, quite easy. It's called the 7E model. Uh, and it really shows how you can step by step implement uh, behavioral change in a structured way into your strategy. So it starts by telling that you have to segment your target groups. So you don't have just one target group that you send all these messages to, you have several ones. Uh, every target group has its own characteristics, has its own attitude towards sustainable mobility, meaning that you have to uh, address them uh, with a different message. For example, someone who is uh, quite ignorant uh, about a problem, you have to give them uh, information rather than, um, rather than uh, inspire them with something else. And other people who are already showing test behavior, so who are already using the bike, well, maybe you can give them some extra incentives so that they keep doing the right behavior. So that's actually what this model uh, tool, uh, tells. And then at the end, as I said, it's really important to evaluate and to improve and see what works and what doesn't work, because it's not an exact science, of course. Behavioral change is something that you have to evaluate. It's something that you have to see uh, whether it's working or not. And, uh, adjust your strategy to that.
Okay, and then on the following slide, there are some examples of soft measures that we're actually quite actively working on. So as I said, uh, raising awareness campaigns, because that's the most important thing, and actually step two for people to change their behavior. They have to know that there is a problem and that, they are, that there are solutions. Uh, those solutions uh, are uh, developed um, in our marketplace for mobility, what uh, Marika already talked about. So we really try to work together with private providers to create extra mobility services. Uh, one example of this uh, are our project calls. So we uh, launch a call telling people if you have interesting projects that can be developed in a quite uh, short note, uh, time, in a quite, yeah. quite short time, uh, tell us we can give you support, financial support and also communicative support because it's always not always easy for a provider as well to have access to a network to really uh, launch its product in a successful way. So we help them as a city with that. Uh, we have also created our own travel planner, which is a multimodal one, which is quite unique in the world, actually. So what it does, it really incorporates all mobility solutions that are available in Antwerp and gives combinations for the smartest route. So it can, for example, say, uh, to get easy to the uh, city center, you have to park your car at the park and ride, take the tram to the city center and use a shared bike for your last half kilometer, let's say. So there's no other travel planner that gives advice like that. And in Google Maps, for example, you have to choose, I want to take the bike, I want to take the public transport or the car. But our road planner really combines it. So actually, it's, it's our entire mobility policy into one useful uh, travel planner, uh, one useful app, um, which is also uh, the basis for our development of our mass ecosystem. So uh, mass providers can incorporate this tra travel planner into their app as well, so that we really uh, reach everyone, let's say that's the goal at least. Um, then next to that, we also have a dedicated informative platform where we combine uh, all information on mobility in Antwerp. Like Marijke said, uh, before uh, this existed, people didn't know which road orbs were taking place, where everything was uh, in a, scattered in a different uh, platform on different websites. So really bundle this together on one platform. Um, we also work actively together with employers because they, of course, play a very important role on how commuters come to work and go uh, to go around in the city. Um, and we work, of course, together with the citizens because they are the ones who are living in the city and we have to make the city livable and accessible also for them as well. And to the last mm -hmm. one, I would like to add something. Uh, when, we come, when we look at our citizens, uh, actually it's our own residents that are already, they have already shifted. Uh, when we look at the city center, more than 60% of our residents they uh, make their trips by means of public transport or by bike. Uh, so what we do there is really we support them. And the lady you see, well, I'll just translate this. Uh, she's telling, uh, I'm going on a, to Antwerp in a smart way. But we often have, uh, really, we use these kind of uh, um, uh, uh, messages or signs to say, thank you very much for doing the right thing. Uh, and this really helps. It really makes. Uh, smart ways to Antwerp, a kind of a love brand that really people like to embrace as well. Yes, for yeah. example, on the International uh, Compliment Day, there is such thing, I think, in, in spring. We really go next to the bicycle lane and hold these plates up to the people and we really see that this works and uh, people tweet about it and, and post pictures of it on social media. So that's really this marketing approach that helps uh, to solve the mobility issue. So it shows that it's not only you don't only have to build this bike lane, but you also have to make sure that people are using it and encourage them while doing it. Um, and really create a positive vibe and attitude about mobility, which is sometimes a hot and not very nice topic for people to talk about. <laughs> no, I think that's a very inspiring way of um, elements that, that you've been able to use, that you are drawing on to engage people. You you just started mentioning already that you're having success, uh, you know, that uh, that you're already seeing results. Um, I, yeah. And so I would like to hear more about um, how you're able to measure that. 
and and then I'm interested also. Uh, you know, it seems that that there's only a this is only a very short period of time that we're talking about. If you know some of those, uh, the the change in mission really is a 2016 2017 shift. You know, we're in 2019 and just in the middle of it. You know, so I would imagine that coming up with and an implementing even the easier and cheaper infrastructure options, but also tools like your planner, etc. All of that takes time and diligence, you know, project management, etc. You know, uh, how much of your ideas have you already been able to implement and didn't it take like a lot of additional people for your department, etc.? Yeah, we'll go into that right away. <laughs> um, perhaps uh, if you can show the next slide after the soft uh, measures uh, and it, we'll uh, we, we'll try to uh, set up the the screen share uh, afresh. So keep yeah, talking. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, so, uh, while you're trying that, I'll I'll, I'll just uh, explain. Um, uh, ah, before we go into the results, I'll just explain how big the team is that is working on all this. Um, it started out in 2016, I think, with about two people. And then, uh, thanks to the European Commission and, and Civitas Portis project, we were able to expand the team to 15 people. So there are 15 persons working on smart ways to Antwerp today. Uh, and it's this, it's this team of 15, pe of 15 persons that is really doing everything. Uh, but we are a very uh, dedicated team. I think it's also a very enthusiastic team. Uh, and we're really passionate about what we're doing. And I think that's the reason why we were able to, to do all this in such a short time. Uh, I know that other teams in other cities are often far bigger. Uh, we know that Rotterdam work with about um, 60, 60 persons uh, in their team. Uh, but yeah, we were able to steal a lot of uh, the good things that they were doing. And so we were able to do it with uh, a very small team, but dedicated and expert people. And um, yeah, and what, what also is driving this team are, of course, the results, um, because it's it's uh, it's uh, very gratifying to work on a project where you can actually see what you're doing. Um, we had a, a big uh, kind of a target. We knew that in 2017, because there was one big uh, uh, roadwork in the city centre uh, that was going to block the entire city centre. And we knew that if, if we weren't able to reduce the number of cars around this, uh, this period, then the entire city would end up in a gridlock. And we knew this because we had a, a minor accident a couple of years before, and then we saw that indeed the city became gridlocked. So we knew that we had to get about between somewhere between 10,000 and 15,000 cars out of the city center every day, every working day. While at the same time, we didn't want to see a reduction of the number of visitors during the weekend, because then, of course, we would have seen a kind of decrease in what the retailers and our uh, restaurant people and pubs and, and all the leisure sector would, would really be really, really uh, damaged, very badly damaged. So this was the, the very uh, clean target that we, we were put uh, before. Um, and it was really amazing to see what all the work really ended up in, because as soon as the roadblocks started, uh, before uh, in in 2017, immediately afterwards we went to and and we saw what what the, the effects were. We saw a reduction of 10,000 cars, and because of the work that we have been doing with Smart Ways to Antwerp, we saw that this reduction even uh, became it, it it became it grew. So by now we already we are we are very close to the target of 15,000 cars fewer than 15,000 cars entering the city every day, whereas we don't see a change in the weekend, which is great because our retailers, they're still very happy and our restaurant keepers and, and so on, they're still really, they're thinking we're doing a great job. We're seeing more visitors coming to Antwerp and more visitors are changing um, their trips into train trips uh, and they are making use of the available uh, park and rides. So we see more people coming to Antwerp, but less cars coming to Antwerp, which is great. Yeah. 
So this was the result for the cars in the city centre. I think the next slide, ah yes, will show will show you what the cooperation with the, our uh, companies uh, results in. Um, with every company that uh, we start a collaboration with, and we have been targeting the largest companies, of course, because we have a very small team of what we call uh, accessibility managers. We started out with two accessibility managers. Today, I have four, a team of five people uh, covering this this task. Um, and because we started out with a very small team, we targeted really the largest companies or organizations in the city and the wider region. So we, you had to have more than 1,000 employees before you were able, we were, we were willing to come to you and talk to you. Today we have more than uh, we have more than 110 companies uh, that have a, a kind of a, a contract with us. Uh, and, small and big ones. Yeah, small and big ones, uh, SMEs and 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 large, very large organizations. But the contracts, uh, whenever you you uh, engage yourself uh, as a, as a CEO uh, in a contract with the city, the first thing that we come and do is we make a mobility scan. So we really kind of make an X-ray of what your uh, employers are doing, and then we saw that of the companies that have joined us, um, of all the employees they have, more than 60 percent took the car to come to work, which is quite a lot. Um, and then when we looked at what would be possible, uh, how, how, what, what could the alternatives be, we saw that there was quite a lot of uh, opportunity for cycling. And so we really started to work on the idea, yeah, quite a lot, quite a lot of employees could shift to, uh, to cycling, which also uh, gives a health benefit because yeah, we have we, we have a knowledge based kind of economy here in Antwerp. So a, a, quite a lot of people sit behind their desks for more than eight hours a day. So if you also go home uh, or travel to to your job sitting in a car, it's not really good for your health and definitely not in the long term. So they saw quite a lot of health benefits there. And they also saw a lot of opportunities to build competition between teams. So it also helps in creating a good atmosphere at, at the workplace. And so a number of uh, the, the early adopters or the, the, the companies that we started out in 2016, they allowed us to make a first kind of uh, post measurement at the end of 2018. And uh, we were really amazed because uh, we saw a shift of about 20% of uh, car drivers and they shifted towards cycling. Um, they, they shifted towards cycling by bikes or by e-bikes. So uh, especially uh, the shift towards e-bike is really, really spectacular. Uh, and it's uh, 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 quite a number of people um, have taken up uh, drive, riding around with e-bikes in Antwerp. And that to such an extent that there is a, even a, a, Swiss, a Swiss company that they couldn't believe the sales figures. Uh, they couldn't believe that it was true that Antwerp that in Antwerp so many people were buying their bikes so they thought their salesperson was kind of making up figures <laughs> so they came and visited us and they saw that it was true we have quite a lot of speed pedelecs today uh, riding around the city but also normal e-bikes so this has really been uh, what we call the hole in the market um, so people shift towards uh, the e-bike and it's uh, yeah what we see here it, it really explains why you have this the steep decrease in cars entering the city center. I think the next slide will show you the results. Of, uh, uh, specific case of the e-bikes. So, yeah. uh, you know, as with uh, electric cars, uh, you know, they are of much higher cost than your average bike. So there was there there was basically no financial incentive provided directly, or was there? No, one there was. There was, okay. there was. We had uh, we had the double incentive scheme. And, um, not that many people made use of it, but uh, we had about two thousand uh, applications uh, for the incentive scheme that we have drawn up. And I think of these two thousand one, uh, uh, yeah, about fifteen hundred uh, applications were really in the end. They, these were really uh, uh, car drivers that shifted and they got the subsidy or the incentive. It's, it, the, the amount was not that high. Uh, I think you could get up to two, uh, 200, 250 euros. And if your employer 
was also uh, uh, in a contract with uh, Smart Waste to Antwerp, we added another 200 euros. So it was up to 450 euros that you could get out of the scheme. But yeah, when you look at the price of an e-bike, it's not really uh, it's not really that high. So because we have a number of people buying e-bikes over 5,000 or 6,000 euros. So. But a lot of companies offer uh, also a lease biking, yeah. uh, lease bikes to their employees, and that of course helps to stimulate the use of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And once you've tried an e-bike, yeah. yeah, it's very <laughs> difficult uh, <laughs> to go back to yeah. a normal bike, so you have to buy one. Yeah. And uh, are there also has it also inspired new businesses or new business models? Is there say an e-bike sharing yeah. made in Antwerp, for example? Uh, we have an, uh, a request for information on uh, uh, e-bike sharing. It started, it was launched at the beginning of this week and we hope to close it by the end of September, uh, by the mid of September. Uh, no, it's not It's not in place yet, but we see, uh, of course, you see the e-bike lease systems, which is, uh, it's a new kind of business that was developed due to uh, one of the first project calls on the marketplace. It was something new. Um, and we see that companies really use that as an incentive for their employees. So young students, well, people that the graduates that are um, starting with their new job, they often choose an employee because they offer uh, an e-lease bike scheme, mm -hmm. not because they offer a car scheme. So yeah, it's really working. It's uh, hip and trendy to uh, choose for an employee mm -hmm. that, that hands out e-bikes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Ah, uh, yes. When we have a look at uh, what the the, the long-term effects, because this is the, the data that you're seeing right now. They're the data that, that uh, are derived from the survey that got started somewhere in 2009. Uh, and here we you see an overview of um, the model split uh, as of 2015 and how that evolved. And yes, you see a kind of a car peak in 2016. This might be due to a kind of a sample effect, we don't know, because when you have a look at the figures, you really see a decrease in the use of, of, um, of, of, of cars uh, for trips uh, by the Antwerp residents. You see an increase in use of bike. You see public transport is, is on the decrease. But this is because of the fact that as a city, we have our own uh, bike shared scheme and we doubled that over the, uh, yeah, somewhere between 2015 and 16. And uh, what we see is that the more shared bikes we put out in the public domain, the less uh, people use uh, public transport. They often prefer the shared bike because it's available whenever you want to make your trip, whereas you have to wait for a bus or for a tram and then the bike is there, you just take it and yeah, you put it back wherever you want. So um, yeah, we really see that that cannibalizes uh, the offer made by the public transport company. But since we are now expanding our tram lines, we'll probably see an increase of use of public transport again. We also see, and this is really something special, uh, the fact that the category other has gone up from 3% uh, up to 7%. And this is really a kind of a significant change. And the other are, of course, e-scooters uh, and e-motor uh, mo uh, mopeds and stuff like that. Um, this is really something that is really embraced by people in Antwerp because they were used to the bike sharing scheme. Whatever shared scheme that enters uh, our, um, our city, it's really taken up in a very, very rapid way. Uh, so uh, when we started out, we had very few shared vehicles uh, in the city. I think in 2017, we had simply the 1,500 uh, shared bikes offered by the city. And I think we had about 200 shared cars. When you look at the offer that we can make today, it's more than 5,000 shared vehicles that are available. And wherever you look in the city, you see people moving around with one of these vehicles. So they're not, you don't see them parked. You see them moving around, which is really a good thing. Um, you don't see a very steep increase in the number of cars, but this is because um, 
The city, of course, is it's it's a medieval. It has a medieval center. You don't have that many parking spaces, uh, and we really don't want cars as the main uh, use of uh, as the main kind of transport that you use for in-city or in in interurban uh, uh, intra-urban uh, trips. So these are uh, we we want the, these schemes at the at the edge of the city um, and rather in the uh, uh, adjoining uh, municipalities. Uh, but yeah, you see that all the other kind of vehicles, they're really uh, still on the rise, yeah. And often they're uh, electric vehicles, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so as you can see, these are these are quite positive results. So there is, of course, room for improvement always, but we are quite happy to have reached this in such a sh well short amount of time, actually. And that also doesn't go, go by unnoticed. So uh, what we're doing actually right now with the Root Plan 2030 is to see whether we can uh, upscale this Antwerp approach to the entire Antwerp transport region. So that's actually something that is quite new since last year, I yeah. think. Yes, uh, so based on movements of people, we have uh, created an entire transport region. Um, and now we are looking if we can have an integrated approach based on that, because now, of course, we're limited to our city's boundaries, but a lot of people that are coming to Antwerp um, are coming from our, outside of the city and other way around as well. People from Antwerp are also going to the cities around it. So uh, it really would be better to have an integrated approach for the entire region and for this uh, the Flemish government uh, is actually looking a bit at Antwerp because we have this successful approach within the city. So to look if we can upscale that to the entire uh, region consisting of 33 cities and municipalities. So it will be, of course, uh, quite a challenge to have them all on board and to have a common vision and common uh, specific measures, but it's a challenge that we're willing to accept, I think, mm -hmm. um, and we're looking forward to working on that as well and to make really the transport region um, effect. Yeah. yeah. Super exciting to see that you are also <laughs> broadening uh, yes. out. And, um... and this is really happening right now with, for example, the uh, request for information for the shared e-bike uh, scheme, so it's really a hot topic at this moment. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, because we are ourselves based in Berlin and I'm uh, looking jealously at some of the activities <laughs> that you're undertaking, despite the fact that there's progress here too. But um, I back uh, to you, I, uh, and actually that idea of uh, exchanging with others, sharing best practices. You mentioned earlier how you have benefited from the experience of other cities. And of course, you are part of this uh, European initiative, Civitas Portis, that, that connects uh, specifically port cities. But um, can you say maybe, you know, what from your experience are actually your key lessons learned and, and how are you exchanging with other cities to, you know, share that information and that experience? Key lessons learned. <laughs> oh, uh, we learned quite a lot, and and simply by going and going out and looking at other cities, and um, what we learned, what what uh, what I learned about most was having a look at what the goals are of other cities, what their strategies are, and then how they are organized, how many people they have, what kind of competences that they have hired, and what the budget is that they are working with. I think this is always very, very inspiring, because uh, the and the, what we have learned. Uh, well, the key lesson what, that I have learned is, I was I was able to benefit from the mistakes and the errors that other cities have made, and I was I'm really very grateful that they were always very open about what worked, but also very open about what didn't work, and it's what doesn't work that you don't want to that you you don't want to repeat that. And it's because I was able um, to learn from Rotterdam and what didn't work there. I was able to learn from Maastricht and what didn't work there. I was able to learn also from Paris and what didn't work there. And uh, I think the fact that p uh, cities are always um, have always been willing to share that as well, that has made us, uh, uh, yeah, that enabled us to make quite a lot of progress in a very fast way. Uh, and this is, uh, yeah, for me, the lesson learned is if you want innovation to work, be open and honest about everything so that 
you can uh, help the others benefit from what really works, uh, but also withhold them uh, from falling in the same pitfalls that you have uh, fallen in before. So uh, yeah, I think that's uh, for me the key lesson. And that's actually what we are also trying to do in the Civitas Portis project. Because of course, first of all, we have this consortium of five cities and we learn from each other. But also through this project, we have actually access to the entire Civitas network and beyond actually. Um, so we really, because that we learned so much from other cities, we try to do the same actually for, for other cities as well. And keep on learning, of course, because it's, because it never stops. Yeah. So really, yeah, yeah. thanks to the yeah. Sportis project, we, we're doing that as well. And we see that we get a lot of questions also from other yeah. cities to 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 help them or to give advice, but also on the things that didn't work because that's also very valuable information. Yes, of course. And so you know we are very grateful that that you took the time to also share that information through the medium of this webinar. And uh, it's a good opportunity for me to remind again all our viewers that there are still slots available for the EFEX study tour running from the 22nd to the 28th of September 2019, which will be going through Brussels and Verve, uh, where you can see uh, some of uh, those exciting and innovative ideas in action, uh, and then Rotterdam and Amsterdam, and you can find more information on our website and at futurex.org. So very looking forward to also personally being able to see uh, Anper again. And uh, uh, we're very grateful um, uh, that you shared that experience with us. And uh, we're looking forward to um, further opportunities for, for dialogue and exchange. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have and a big well, uh, we're happy to welcome you here in Antwerp in September. Excellent. We're really looking forward to it. Uh, thanks uh, to everybody who was uh, watching online and, and also is uh, going to be seeing uh, uh, read broadcasts and online streams. Again, a big thank you to both Maya Eike and, and Katja and have a very good evening. You're welcome. Thank you. Yeah, bye. <laughs> bye.